Happy Friday and welcome to another episode of Brain Scratch. I'm John Lorden. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today as we do, I believe this is our fourth episode on the Lindsay Buziak case. Now, if you haven't watched the previous ones, I'll have them in the description box down below. This is an interview with Lindsay's father, Jeff. This will be the third interview that I've done with him. We go into everything and these interviews are lengthy. And because we've already done uh, the previous two, I think ran almost 90 minutes each, we're just gonna pick up the conversation here and roll forward. So if you wanna be sure to understand all the context, if you watched those previous episodes, I think you'll be fine. But if you haven't seen, especially the previous two interview episodes, you're probably really gonna want to listen to those before coming into this one, because I've kind of formed the questions based off the knowledge of, of the previous two, as well as some new details that have come out about the case. But with all that being said, let's go ahead and bring on Jeff Buziak. Welcoming back to the channel after, I think it's been five years, Jeff. Welcome back. Well, thanks a lot, John. It's great to be back on your uh, channel. And uh, yeah, it's been some time, hasn't it? And I'm glad we decided to do an update again. I think it's uh, timely. And uh, let's hope uh, everybody pays attention to this and uh, we get some traction. And more than anything else, I really appreciate all your support. And, uh, you know, we want to rest here in Lindsay's Unsolved Murder. And so... With your uh, assistance, of course, and all your followers, followers helping out, uh, hopefully that pressures the authorities to work a bit harder and get this done. Yeah, yeah. And I know that's been a real point of contention for you. If, if you guys haven't seen, we've done two other interviews with Jeff. I think they were back in 2018. I'll have links to all that in the description box down below and my original episode on this case. Plus, if you just want to get kind of caught up quickly, I'll be releasing a new Seriously Mysterious on Tuesday. So about 20 minute version, re retelling the story just to get you up to speed. Um, so Jeff, I also just want to say this to start off. There are no named suspects in this case, right? Or even persons of interest really that have been named by police. No, officially there are no named suspects or persons of interest at all. Police will not share any information. Very little has come out. Uh, the stuff that has come out from them, they're now saying it's uh, false information on the internet or they say, there's people out there that are giving out all kinds of false information. Well, all that information has come from them. So, you know, they're criticizing themselves. Yeah, yeah. Well, basically, I just want to put out there, of course, we're going to be talking about a lot of different people, but with no named suspects or persons of interest, everyone is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. That being said, talking about bad information, in January of 2023, a publication called Capital Daily released an article called The Case That the Internet Got Wrong. And it's about this case. In that article, um, I think it's a pretty clever title. There's really only one paragraph where they talk about information that is seemingly drastically wrong. And, and we'll get to that a bit later. But they spend some time talking about the production of the Case File podcast episode. And they kind of paint you as a person that is controlling and really wanted to control the narrative in terms of your production with case file. Interestingly, Capital Daily also refers to one of my episodes with you. They have it linked several places in the article and actually in different articles. And they never reached out to me to ask what my experience was like producing something with you. And I can honestly say, I do not remember one suggestion one correction. As a matter of fact, the exact opposite. Anytime I've talked to you before we actually got this camera rolling and said, hey, Jeff, is it okay for us to talk about this? Or should we watch out talking about that? You have been the type of person to say, no, yes, let's address it. So much so that in the second interview I did with you, we even talked about personal information about things in your past that have absolutely nothing to do with this case. And you were like, yes, let's address it. If that's what they're saying in the comments, they want to know the answer, let's address it. So I just wanted to be very clear. Um, first of all, in my experience with you, I have never seen anything like that. Outside of that, I also want to be very clear. I've dealt with a lot of families in these situations. And one of the earliest lessons I learned was you guys are dealing with very strong emotions. You're dealing with terrible situations that none of us would want to be an expert in. And I have seen other family members that sometimes will want some form of, hey, I want to edit 
that script before it goes or something like that. And sometimes you can make accommodations for that and sometimes you can't. But it was just very strange to me because that piece by Capital Daily seemingly wants to profess that they have information the rest of the world doesn't. They don't provide their source and they really don't provide the details to kind of back that up. But by the end of the article, it really turns into a slander piece against you. Do you know why? Do you know that author or the, the journalist? Yes, I do. As a matter of fact, he's uh, from across the country and uh, brought up spoiled little rich kid, lived in Lake, what they call the Lake District in Ontario. Um, bit of a weird dude and uh, socially awkward. You know, I think um, when I look back on it, I think he started with great intentions. Uh, he's easily mis misled, a bit naive fellow. And uh, I think in the end, uh, he got swayed to go a different direction and to stay focused with the truth. And I think also in the end, they were probably running out of money or some other thing was going on at Capital Daily. So he got desperate and turned it into tabloid journalism, yeah. in my opinion. Yeah. I just want people to understand where I come from on that whole issue. First and foremost, I get contacted constantly from people all around the world, and I appreciate it very much. What happens is the odd time somebody is persistent and they do want to be more involved. And my spiel with them always from the beginning is, I really appreciate that. And they say, well, what can I do? I usually say, you know, write, write the authorities. And so if they do that, then they come back and say, well, what more can I do? And this started way back at the beginning. Even my first volunteers, one of who now speaks out against me, who was the whistleblower, so-called, in that article. Mm -hmm. When people like that approach me and they want to be more involved, I always tell them, find your niche. Like, just research this to the nth degree, communicate with me, find out where you fit in, where what you want to do. I don't assign anything to anybody i don't say to them okay here's what we need to do and you know i want to get this person and all that stuff i don't do any of that you know yes if they've been involved with me for some time on a really serious basis meaning maybe daily or all that stuff where we're communicating a lot yes i ask them to do certain things but not nefariously i'll say hey can you check out to, you know, for instance, can you check out John Lorden? We, I want to know more about him. Who is this guy? What's he do? Find me all the information you can. And then when they do, you know, I might say, oh, gee, you know, that person we just researched, like, they're not good. Maybe we should keep them, you know, suspicious or something like that. Yes, you know, that part, of course, because I'm directing things. Right. But as far as other things, I'm very open to people. If people get close to me and ask me, what do I think? I'll tell them. You know, because I have my personal opinion went on with my daughter's murder, and I'm not afraid to share that. I tend not to publicly because I don't want to sway everybody, but I will publicly. I think I did in our articles tell you who I think is involved. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm not afraid to do that in my opinion, but I don't want people to think they have to follow everything that I say. I want them to make up their own minds. I've been that my whole life with anybody, including my children. Make up your own mind. Here's the information. If you want my opinion, ask me. So, you know, as far as somebody trying to con trying to turn this around and say that I'm this controlling guy and I want everything a certain way, no, that's not true at all. I'm open, actually. I probably deal with three or four or five whatever theories of what happened to my daughter, mm -hmm. and I promise myself to stay open with them. I Do I have a personal one? Yes, I do. But do I force that on people? No, I don't. Do I follow all the other ones? Yes, I do. I try and stay neutral. I try and think of, okay, this one, this one, this one. And I'm always taking new information and trying to fit it into these different theories to see where it fits. My focus is seeing that the people responsible for the murder of my daughter are arrested. That is my focus. I don't like to be distracted with uh, crap and BS and lawsuits and all that kind of stuff. I'm not interested in that. I get people calling me every week saying, you know, oh, you should sue this. You should sue that. You know, they slandered you, you did that. You know, I don't care. I stay focused on how do we get the people responsible arrested for my daughter's murder. That's really my focus. I'm an open book. I have nothing to hide. I won't hide anything. I talk openly. Um, there's really nothing I won't address when I'm approached by 
wonderful people like you or just want to get the story out. Um, I'm always say I want this to be raw. I want it to be spontaneous. I don't really want to know what we're going to talk about. Yeah. I don't need to know. Um, hit me with whatever you want. That's fine. I'll speak about it. Or I'll tell you I won't. One of the two. But typically, I speak about everything. And uh, what my focus is, of course, is telling my truth, telling people what I know, in hopes that that helps to see the people responsible, arrested, convicted, and behind bars. Which is what I think any parent is going to do in your situation. So it is weird to me to see that piece. And I don't want to completely slam Capital Daily's piece on this because I do think there's some interesting information that they bring forward. It's an interesting perspective to even kind of go up against someone as big as Dateline and be like, well, Dateline, you know, didn't report on this exactly accurately. Um, and I'm all for hearing about considerations like that. But there is definitely a twist in the article where the end, I mean, it is just a prolonged rant kind of attacking you as a person. And I don't understand what the benefit of that is. I don't understand how it helps uh, the understanding of the case. And I'm going to do my best to try to keep us on track, even with this conversation, because I could probably talk for an hour just about issues that I, I took up with that article. But yeah, I could as well. And, yeah. you know, what happens with certain police officers, um, the, the reporter there from Capital Daily, for whatever reason, they made it personal. And when once they make it personal, then they have to do this sparring thing with me. I'm not interested in that. But if somebody wants to make it personal, sure, go ahead. I can lay out a bunch of crap myself about any individual. And if I don't know it, I'll find out. Yeah. So, you know, so be it. Let them do it. And, you know, part of the thing is any press is good press. So if there want to be some negativity, fill your boots. That If that gets more viewership, I think people see through that, John. I really do, because I'm not trying to hide anything. God forbid that this never gets solved. But I'll tell you, I'm going to work at it till the day I die. And when it is solved with people arrested and convicted... I want to just disappear. If people think I want this to be part of my life, whoa, that's the last thing I want. And as far as me being vindictive and wanting to, you know, do some kind of crazy stuff, no, I just want my country to enact justice. And they're not doing it. That's really disappointing for me. I just want justice for my daughter's murder. I don't really care what they do with the people involved. Obviously, I'd like to see them strung up and whipped or, you know, whatever thing that gets you angry about that. But really, I just, I want them arrested and convicted for the murder because that's what the law of the land is supposed to do. Right, right. Um, just to shift gears a little bit, I really want to know, how was the walk this year? Did we get out there and do it again this year? Yes, we did. And, you know, as long as I can do it, I'll do it every year. The walk was good. Weather's always great because it can be questionable. But uh, I think Lindsay and a few other angels I have up there are making sure we're, uh, we're pretty good uh, as far as weather every walk. So, yes, it was good. We had a nice turnout. Uh, we do get some media coverage. So, you know, I can't ask for anything more. The walk for me is... Um, you know, it's hard to do because I have to relive the whole scenario in my face. Um, but it, in a way, it's a relief to make me believe that it's doing something and that I'm doing something about it. And uh, and also, it's a time to gather with friends right. that are in support and and. And we get to hug each other and share. And that's so important. It's so important nowadays with all the electronic stuff. Everybody wants to Zoom and text and whatever we do. But to be there in person to hug people and to, you know, just feel that energy from others, the love, of course, um, is fantastic. And just to know that I'm not alone out there. Yeah. In the room. Um, all right. So in our previous conversations, we've talked about 
we have several different names and I, I just want to kind of run them by you and see if there's any updates in terms of their status with the case or their status period over the past five years. In previous interviews, we referred to him as CO. He, how, he has now been named by Capital Daily. Uh, so that's Cohen Oatman. Can you give us just a brief recap of who Cohen is and have there been any updates or any developments with him lately? Yeah, Cohen Oatman is the friend that uh, accompanied Jason Zalo to the murder scene, reluctantly got together with Jason, uh, supposedly to go out for dinner before their hockey game, and uh, he ended up involved in a murder scene. So he's very stressed out about the whole thing. It's kind of uh, really disturbed his whole life, uh, along with it. He has a wife and children, and it's just been devastating for him. Uh, he's found other work. Uh, he works uh, as a casino manager in a different part of the province, and he's still involved in the mortgage business, uh, licensed by Jason Zalo, as a matter of fact. And uh, so, as far as updates, uh, he uh, he appears to be cooperating as much as he can with whatever police ask him to do. Uh, he stays in contact with me. Sometimes we've had a few... Uh, heated discussions but it usually ends well and uh, he promises to stay in touch and answer all my questions and phone calls if i try and contact him i don't bother him at all yeah uh, maybe we talk once a year just to stay in touch but uh he's there and um you know what's the main whether... point what's the main point of contention between the two of you is he just like you know the Zalos aren't related to this. They have nothing to do with it. And you're kind of pushing in that direction that they are. Is that the main issue between you guys or? No, not at all. And we don't have an issue between us. There, there was some recent stuff at his work about people writing there, complaining about him. And he felt I was the source of that. So we had to have a good discussion about that. He was very angry about that. And I just said, you know, Cohen, why would I do that? I'm trying to be friendly with you. You're an integral part of of solving this murder. You're a witness. Um, why would I try and burn that bridge or make it difficult between us? It's not me at all. Whoever was doing that was on their own volition. And so it had nothing to do with me. So we kind of cleared the air. He understands. And we left well. He just said, you know, call me anytime, Jeff. You got any questions? So, you know, I don't bother him too much. Um, I don't know. Like, personally, I don't... Um, I don't know what to think about his whole involvement. Um, you know, part of me says that he's just an innocent guy caught up in a bad, bad scenario. And another part of me says he knows more than what he's telling me. Hmm. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I know that about a number of people, that they know more than what they'll share with me. And so I can rationalize that by saying, okay, that's fine. Um, because if it's anything to do with jeopardizing the future case, if there is one, um, against the people involved, fine, don't tell me, that's okay. Uh, but if it's somebody holding back because they're keeping it a secret, that, yeah, I don't like that. Sure. And I, I sense maybe a little bit of that with Cohen, but uh, I'm not saying that in a negative way. If he's not comfortable sharing something with me, that's fine, I understand. Yeah. He has a wife and children. And I'm very public, and and I certainly share information that I get. So, you know, I get it. So I feel I'm square with Cohen. Okay. Being an outside observer to all this, like, that's why I didn't even want to use his name in the previous episodes, because I thought if there is an unwilling participant in all of this, it's Cohen or, or an unwilling accomplice of some kind, at least that's what it looks like from out here. But um, Ziggy Matheson, who is Ziggy and what are the updates? Yeah, Ziggy's a slimy little bastard who's done nothing in his life except sell drugs. He got busted here a few years ago and I think did, you know, whatever they do in Canada. They sent them to eight years and they serve, you know, 20 months or some stupid thing with the way the laws are. Um, he was a family friend and tenant of the Zalo family. I've uh, been involved in murder before. He got off murder, uh, certainly in, in one of the cases. The deal was cut. One of his buddies who was there at the murder scene with him when they murdered a guy 
uh, took the rap and the deal was cut that, okay, if I take the rap, he gets off. I don't have to testify against him, all that kind of stuff. He's just a slimy bastard. And um, he's still lurking around. He's out of prison now. And, uh, you know, I, I feel, in my opinion, he knows what went down and he knows why. And, of course, the slimy rats like him never talk. They talk. You know, it's funny. I've learned over these 15 years the bad guys or criminals or whatever you want to call these guys that preach this rat thing all the time. I've learned over this 15 years, the ones that bring up the rat thing that really focus on it and talk about it a lot, they're rats. Yeah. They're the rats. Yeah. They are rats. And certainly he's one of them. Cause I had uh, more than one individual call me and tell me that Ziggy ratted them out. Hmm um to forward his business dealing drugs right and these were sort of employees of his and his chain of drug dealing so he's around he's kind of gone underground um you know he's publicly called me a piece of shit and you know all that stuff and he's just a bad bad actor and you know as far as i'm concerned with the overpopulation of the earth people like that they, we should just get rid of them yeah. you know yeah just get rid of them. They have no useful purpose on this earth whatsoever, except to make society worse. Right. That's all they're here for. Just get rid of them. In the previous episodes, there was a lot of focus given to Vid Acevedo. And part of that was because the murder phone uh, seemed to trace to Vid's home the night before. At least this is what you, you had told me previously. Um, is that still part of the focus here? Has that changed? Are there any updates on Vid from the past five years? Well, as far as Vid goes, he's another low-life scum that's just lurked around and slithered around the streets of Victoria his whole life. None of these guys have, ever have jobs. They dysfunction off the drug trade. Uh, Vid's, you know, alcoholic, diabetic mess right now who's got a big mouth and talks like he's some big gangster, but he's just another useless piece of crap on the planet. Um, his deal was, you know, as far as we could determine from information, we got both off authorities and other spots, I guess, that the cell phone came over. He was at the ferries the same time the cell phone arrived. He and the cell phone, whether they were together or not, seemed to travel the same direction and it spent overnight in the same area where he lived. So that's how that whole vid thing came about. Of course, he's tied to all the bad people on the streets in Victoria. And most of them have kind of shunned him now because he just turned into a mess. Um, his deal is, I've had a couple confrontations with him. And the last one where we met in person, Sandwich police were present. And uh, he said to me, uh, he actually hollered at me, you're fucking going down and um, I looked at Santa's police and I said, hey, this guy's threatening me, like arrest him. They're like, oh, you provoked him. You know, our system just protects scumbags like this. So that's where he's at. He's lurking around someplace, still making money off the drug trade, dealing drugs. Police know that. They don't do anything about it. And typically, I've also learned over these 15 years that the people that are involved in the drug trade that are well known by police and everybody else, the reason they're not busted, because I used to be curious about that. I'd ask the police, well, do you know about Vid? Yeah. Do you know he's a drug dealer? Yeah, of course we do. Well, why don't you arrest him? Ah, you know, whatever. It's because he's a rat. <laughs> you know, he's informant. So they let him play on the streets and sell drugs, which destroys society. And, um, you know, there they are. So, yes, he is the other one, I think. He smiled at me once, like a smirking smile, and said, I didn't kill her, you know, with this big grinny smile, which I just, you know, physically wanted to wipe it off his face. But of course, oh, I'd go to jail really fast. Um, so that tells me he knows something. He knows what went down and why. So, yeah, both those two, Ziggy and Vid, they know what goes on. They know what happened to Lindsay and they know why and they know who. And, uh, you know, they won't talk. They think they're smart because they won't talk. Yeah. Um, speaking of they know why, um, it seems like 
we're talking about a situation where there was two people that were in the house and they were probably very likely being motivated or directed by some other party outside of the house. So we're looking at at least three people probably that are involved in this. Um, when you're talking about people like Ziggy and Vid, I think that kind of leads us towards one potential theory, which has been talked about a lot online, which is that Lindsay was somehow an informant on a cocaine raid. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? And is that still one of the viable legs that you see for this investigation? There is talk about that. Certainly there's a lot of talk about that. Uh, Saanich police wanted to focus on that a bit, which I think was a distraction. We do know pretty much that, well, I do know, I was told by police, Lindsay wasn't an informant. She didn't inform on any drug bust. Um, she didn't live that lifestyle. She wasn't involved with these drug people. But, you know, Victoria's small town, born, raised, all that there. So she knows some of these characters. Sure, she probably, you know, went to grade four with them or stuff like that. And everybody knows everybody there especially as you're growing up there's probably one or two nightclubs in the city that are popular one maybe that everybody goes to so they all mix and mingle and know who's who in the zoo um, but as far as informant the police know who the informant was on this calgary drug bus that they want to focus on it wasn't lindsay but there's also talk that somebody fingered lindsay as the informant right so right. that these guys jumped all over it um, my opinion on that is it's all crazy talk. Um, if you look at cartel stuff and study it, um, are they going to come to Victoria and kill a little girl because they lost uh, 80 keys of Coke? <laughs> I doubt it. Right. They're shipping hundreds of tons yeah. to North America they part of their business model is they lose a certain amount maybe it's 10 percent or whatever they do in their business model they lose tons every year they know that that's a happening um so is some cartel gonna send some sicarios up to victoria to kill some little girl who had nothing to do with it no if they were gonna kill somebody there'd be like six or eight people hanging from a bridge with no heads by their ankles they're not going to come to victoria and target some little girl who had nothing to do with the drug trade at all yeah i actually talked to some of the people that were involved in that drug bust they know why they were busted they know when they were being surveilled they know how they got busted they know where they screwed up they know they had to pay big and they they, they had no intention i think there was 14 people arrested there was a deal made with Saanich police, with the Calgary police force, that if anybody said anything, they got off scot-free, no criminal record, all that kind of stuff. Nobody out of 14 knew anything about Lindsay's murder. Nothing. And, you know, my psychology degree tells me when you do things like that, you're going to have, out of 14 people, you're going to have two or three that are going to talk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's just odds. It's statistics. There's going to be people that are talk. Yeah. certainly one for sure probably two likely three they had nothing nothing at all and some of these people were facing some, some pretty serious time uh, i think one of them was a mother with a child so you know there would have been threats about you'll never see your child again all that kind of stuff nothing they got nothing out of it um i also talked to you know sort of one of the head of one of the families and he's like jeff come on shit. you know why would we kill lindsay we knew who she was and you know she had nothing to do with it. We know why we got busted. It was a screw up on our part. So I think that's a red herring. You know, maybe there's something there because people have to remember in Victoria, it's one degree of separation. And some of those people in that drug bus were from Victoria. Um, so, you know, is there a connection? Maybe. Was it the main cause? No, no. Okay. Yeah. I think it's quite simple, Lindsay's murder. I think it's quite simple. Police say, oh, it's complicated. And I had a good heart to heart with one of the officers once. And he goes, yeah, you're right. It's simple. But it takes this real circular route to come back to, yeah, it's just simple. But we got to prove it. Right. And previously, you had told me that you were fairly convinced that it was real estate involved. 
in particular because of the mechanism that was used to kind of get her to this location. Uh, she was speaking to this new couple that she wasn't aware of. They said they had been referred to her. And when she asked by who, then a call was placed to try to verify that. But that other person was on vacation at that time. So it seemed to suggest that there was some form of inside knowledge in terms of, you know, hey, we can make an, an excuse. Yeah, we could say we were referred by these people because we know they're not going to be around during that time. Um, is there any reason outside of the obvious Zalo connections why there could be something in terms of real estate, some other aspect of real estate that came after Lindsay? <laughs> No, in my 15 plus years dealing with this, uh, yes, you're right. It was real estate oriented, 100%. I have no doubt in my mind whatsoever. Real estate has been my career since 1980, so I know it intimately. Obviously, that's 43 years now if we do the math. Um, Lindsay's murder was all set up based on real estate and not only based on real estate, but somebody with really, really intimate knowledge about real estate. So it wasn't just lay person off the street saying, hey, let's phone her up for an appointment and get her to show us a house and we'll kill her. No, no, they used a corporate transfer, which even a lot of realtors don't even know about as the basis of it. Um, they set it up so that it was fairy and you know, we're catching the five fairies or the four fairy. Can we meet you right at the house? You know, all this was very coordinated. John, it was almost over planned on a real estate basis. So, you know, there was a Dateline show, of course. And, and I believe the experts there, 100 percent, they said this was somebody close to Lindsay, very close, possibly the same office that had intimate knowledge about real estate. There's no doubt about it. I mean, using the client's name to assure Lindsay that, you know, that's how they got her name. Who would know that? Well, it's somebody very close to her. Not everybody knows who your clients are. And not everybody knows how to do this real estate thing. Somebody knew what would entice Lindsay. Somebody directed her to that house because she phoned me and said, Daddy, I can't find anything else to show them but this one house. And that house happened to be owned by a personal friend of Shirley Zalo and her boyfriend at the time. Um, you know, everything is just set up to surround real estate. And somebody with intimate knowledge about Lindsay's real estate. And the funny part is, is that uh, you know, Jason Zalo was a realtor at the time and a mortgage broker. So he's come up with all these excuses why he wasn't there on time. And when he arrived, he waited 20 minutes, didn't go into the house. To me, it's all just bullshit. He was a mortgage broker. He had been doing mortgages for the people that were involved in sales with Lindsay. So he had every reason to arrive there. Not, not only the one that said, you know, I'm there to protect my girlfriend. Um, he should have been there, should have gone there with her. But also to just say, here's my card. If you require a mortgage, you know, let me know. Yeah. That kind of stuff. So, yeah, it was very real real estate oriented. Without a doubt, somebody with intimate knowledge of real estate. So, you know, as far as, uh, uh, you know, cartel hitman or some hitman hired, no, no. They're not going to set up this beautiful scenario. It was overplanned, and the police admit they got lucky. They really got lucky. Um, because, I mean, you don't even have to watch movies or anything. If if you hired a hitman to kill somebody, they're not going to have this elaborate scenario which op opens them up to getting caught. It's going to be study the person, find out some place where nobody's around that they can kill them and just get the job done, get out of there. Not this, oh, hi, my husband's being transferred. And, you know, this whole scenario. It was like a play, like somebody was doing a novel or following a movie. I watched every movie I could think of to try and see if there's one where they took the pattern from a movie and applied it to Lindsay's case. I haven't found it yet. I'm sure it's out there. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I think there was another podcast called something like Perfect Murder or something like that. And... Uh, yeah, they they planned it out extremely well, and the police say they just got lucky. They got lucky. And part of that luck is the bumbling police force, of course, which is a whole other topic. Yeah, part of what's so difficult about this case is, you know, anyone that is interested in true crime and has taken the time to look up the stats on solved cases, 
knows that an intimate partner is part of that like 50% of the time. Uh, 75% of the time, it's someone that is known directly to the victim. Like there's just, those numbers are telling a very specific story. And when you have a condition like this, where you're like, hey, someone was using real estate and oh, by the way, her boyfriend's in real estate. She's basically working for her boyfriend's mother. Um, I know there's a lot of other connectivity when it, when it comes to family and, and being part of that business. It just really pulls everyone's focus back to the Zalos. And we've had SPD from, I think it was a year after, I think it was in 2009, maybe even before that, uh, announce that, that Jason was not part of this. And even to your point about being a well choreographed or kind of scripted out event, you know, Jason is caught on camera at the shop you know, around the time that this is all starting to go down. Uh, he's with, he's got someone with him when he actually drives up on the scene. They park in a position that I have previously said, you know, that would be a great spot to be a lookout. If you were concerned about someone else coming into the neighborhood, you'd be in a great spot to be able to watch from there and kind of try to head them off. Um, so when you have all these types of conditions and SPD saying, no, 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 the Zalos are cleared. Let me ask you, are the Zalos actually cleared in this is that just a position that police are taking publicly because the investigation's still rolling around in the background as far as i'm concerned the zalos are not cleared i live under the uh condition that yes everybody's innocent until proven guilty yes but also everybody's a suspect until there are arrests so as far as them being cleared, yeah, there was a public announcement that, oh, yeah, we've cleared the Zalos. Well, of course, I asked police to clear me. They refused. Another person phoned in, asked them to be cleared. They refused. I said, why are you refusing? They said, well, we're not in the clearing business. I go, well, obviously you are. You cleared them. They said, yeah, we're not clearing anybody else. I said, well, give me the official word on this whole deal because they supposedly you said they did a lie detector test. They're cleared. So I was uh, told that the official word was, they participated in polygraph testing to our satisfaction at this time. Well, that means nothing. That's a neutral statement. That could have meant they failed, but we're happy they did. So now we're we're, we're really a go. Or, yeah, they passed, or, you know, but they didn't say that. They didn't say pass or fail. They just said participated to our satisfaction. Well, that means nothing. Yeah. You know, your kid could have participated in a ball game by sleeping in center field, but he participated the whole time. You know, yeah. what the hell does that mean? That's true. So anyhow, the other thing was I had a big argument with one of the police officers once and it turned into a holler, hollering match, which I'm not afraid to do. And um, I screamed at him, you know, how could you be so fucking stupid to clear them? And he responded back in heat. They're not cleared. Okay. Okay. That's so I don't know. That's, yeah. that's my truth. I can't be any more clear than that. But people seem to still want to dwell on this. They were cleared. They weren't cleared. Okay. okay. They weren't cleared officially to me or to what I was told. Yeah. Uh, following this statement, I think it's important to point out that as of last year, you've also been notified of a pending lawsuit going on against you that's being filed by Shirley, by Jason's mother. Uh, you and two other uh, people that used to volunteer with you, right? Well, yes, there was a lawsuit filed against two other women and myself for slander and libel. Uh, the thing to point out was the other two women are denying that it was them um, because it was ba it's based on, from what I can determine so far, it's based on the Shirley Zalo side and her lawyer um, saying that they've got information they obtained by a computer expert that says the posts that were posted are liable. They were posted anonymously by fictitious, under fictitious names. And they're saying they've determined who those people are. Well, if they gained access to the site or they did anything untoward, obviously it's an invasion of privacy and it's illegally obtained information. So, what they're saying is, and both these women are denying that it was them, one of them um, is a friend of mine, okay? Not working for me, friend. Okay. The other one 
uh, I didn't know until the lawsuit. And so when I found out, I contacted her and uh, we've since had communication, but I didn't know who, who she was prior to the lawsuit. And as far as the lawsuit against me, I didn't say slanderous or libel things, even though I th do believe in my opinion, based on experience, my education, that Shirley Zalo is the nastiest person I've ever met in my life. Nastiest woman, probably person too, that I've ever met in my life. I did a video reenactment of how I met her once. Uh, she's just nasty, and in my opinion, based on education, experience, everything else, evil. Like, just a bad, bad, bad person. And I'm not afraid that. That's my truth. I can speak that. Um, and that's what I feel it is. So my the lawsuit against me is they're saying, because I allowed it on a website that they say I own. Okay. okay. So they have to prove all that, I guess, that I allowed it and that I own it. And well, that's fine. Yeah, even with that, I don't I don't know about Canada law. I, I don't know much about US law either, but I do know uh, in terms of our kind of freedom of speech down here, that the platforms, at least for right now, are effectively protected. Uh, if they weren't, YouTube would already be taken down, Twitter would already be taken down, because you have all kinds of people making slanderous comments on them uh, constantly. So it's it's interesting to hear that you're kind of wrapped into that because you're, you know, you have the platform. I guess they're basically trying to say it's your responsibility for removing uh, comments like that, which... Um, well, the interesting thing was, you know, those comments were from years ago. They they focused on ones that I think maybe one or two of them are beyond 10 years or five years, whatever it is. Some are earlier. So I contacted them and said, okay, what's your beef here? What's your lawsuit? What are these comments? So they gave me a list of comments. And I said, okay, fine. I'll remove them. So I removed the comments. I go, now, so now what's your problem? What do you want? They just want money. They want money. Hmm. So that's the interesting part they want money they also asked me for they said oh you have to turn over the website you have to give us access to your email all these different things and basically you know to me it's ludicrous it's insane yeah um i would never do that yeah. and i would never turn over anybody uh there's there's more than one administrator to this site and uh, of course they're going to ask for that they'll never get that out of me uh, because they'll just want to sue them. So, uh, you know, why would I ever do that? These are these are good people. You know, these other two women that are being sued, they're uh, senior citizens. You know, these are women that are living on meager pensions, trying to survive, and, um, you know, really concerned about justice, concerned about the plight of women. And uh, they're trying to help out as best they can. And now they're being involved in this lawsuit. I really feel for them. I really do, and 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 will do anything I can to support them, of course. Um, but uh, it's just a it's a vindictive, just a it certainly proves the nature of who Shirley Zalo is to go after people like that. Do you know what she called me a couple of years ago? Because uh, typically she's just been horrible towards me, just nasty, just wicked, wicked woman. Uh, she called me with this facade of, oh, I want to be your friend now and let's like things pass. And I was like, sure, I have no problem with that. Well, there's a big public outcry. They're like, Jeff, how could you do that? And I'm like, I have no problem talking to anybody. If they want to be civil to me and respectful, I'll do it. Do you know, it probably took us three phone calls of over a half hour each in the beginning just to just to set boundaries of how she was going to interact and communicate with me because mm. it's typically just demeaning and vindictive and vengeful and i just wouldn't allow it so we had to go through this scenario probably three different three different times three different phone calls for like a half hour me saying no you can't talk to me like that no lower your voice no ask me questions don't don't be a bully like she's a bully a bully so that's where we're at and of course i knew right away it was just another technique for her to reel me in and you know put me in my place and of course i'm not interested in that kind of crap 
So that didn't last very long. And then lawsuit, of course. And now she's going to use it sort of as part of her excuse. As, oh, I tried to be friends with him. And, you know, which was bullshit. Right. The other thing with the whole lawsuit was when she did call me at that time, because she says, oh, we're out to get her and all that stuff. I'm not out to get anybody except people involved in my daughter's murder. And I offered her at that time, I said, I'll have a pub, I'll have a press conference with you. I invite you to comment on the site. I invite you to go on the site and tell your truth. She refused to do any of those. She wouldn't do a press conference with me. She wouldn't do one on her own. She wouldn't contribute to the site. She wouldn't do anything to tell her side of the story. Obviously, she just wanted to sue. And she told me at that time, she said, I've talked to five or six lawyers in town to sue you, and none of them would take the case. So I guess we better talk. Well, I guess she found some, you know, whatever he is, low level lawyer. I don't know what he is, really. Obviously, you know, I look at it, I look at this lawyer she's got hired, and I think, you know, one, if I take myself out of the picture, who's going to sue a father whose daughter was murdered? And it's unsolved. And this guy's trying to find justice. Someone like, that wanted gonna... to distract him or zap his resources. Right. Shot him up. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And I look at this lawyer and I think, okay, he's younger, a little bit younger than me. But supposedly the information I've received is he's going to retire in a year and a half. And he's been bragging that this is going to be his, you know, going out swan song case. Well, this is a guy who has three daughters. He's divorced now, but he has three daughters. And if you average their ages, they're around the same age as Lindsay when they got murdered. Has he ever done anything to help? No. Has he ever said to me, I'm sorry for your loss? No. He doesn't give a shit. All he cares about is money and getting some kind of notoriety because Lindsay's case is such a high profile case. Right. Like, I just have no respect for the guy. Well, I hope you can find some way to balance that with keeping your focus and efforts going on Lindsay's case. I mean, that's that's ultimately what's most important around all this. But man, having a lawsuit like that swirling around your head, yeah, I bet that would be distracting. Um, it is and it isn't. Yeah. You know, part of me, part of me, John, is I lost my daughter. She was killed, murdered, savagely slaughtered. She was the most wonderful person. I don't give a f yep. about a lot of things anymore. I go through times in my life, you know, regularly. I don't give a f yep. There's nothing more you can do to me. There's nothing more. I've been threatened by all these bad guys, the vids and the stupid Ziggy creeps and all these kind of creeps that, you know, we're going to kill you. We're going to do that. We're going to do this. I have people following me sometimes with blacked out windows and shit like that. I don't care. I've confronted them. I was like, I don't give a f I'm 69 years old. Like, you want to do something to me? Fill your boots. Otherwise, get out of my way. I've got a murder to solve. Yeah. So yeah. as far as that lawsuit, yeah, it's unsettling. And yeah, it's costly. You know, I've had to pay a couple lawyers and do certain things. And, you know, I think that's all part of the other side, just smiling. Because this, this is this, just like this sinister part of Shirley Zalo that gets a charge out of that, you know, gives her that power and control and it just disgusts me. Yeah. And I don't have time for that. And so, yeah, it stresses me out a bit at times. Other times, I really don't give it. My focus is seeing people responsible for Lindsay's murder, arrested, charged, convicted. That's really my goal. The rest of this is just chatter that's not going to distract me. I don't care about bad news articles and all that stuff. Just, you know, do your thing. But that's my focus. Yep. Speaking of which, what have the biggest developments in the last five years been in terms of, of the case? Any new information or anything that looks hopeful, progress of any kind? Well, I think the biggest development is probably because all the support I get from wonderful people like you and your supporters and people who will write in to the mayor of Saanich, to the police chief of Saanich, to the premier of British Columbia, to the attorney general of British Columbia, to the minister of public service, pub or public safety in British Columbia. People that write those letters, when they think, oh, it's not gonna matter if I write a letter, yes, it does. If there's five, no, it doesn't matter. 
If there are 5,000 letters, yes, it matters. Huge, huge. And I need people to understand that. And I need other people that are in my position to understand that as well from around the world, especially in the U.S., and other areas of North America, which, you know, we kind of have the same laws, but certainly around the world. If you can get enough public support to write letters to these authorities, it makes a huge difference. So in the past five years, as far as Lindsay's case, because of all the letters and all the support that we get, uh, the wonderful podcast, the, the, the three-part series that you and I did a few years ago, super helpful. The provincial government finally listened. They contacted me and asked me, you know, what was going on, what my thoughts were, what do I think was required. So we had some discussion about that. As a result, I didn't get what I wanted, of course, but as a result, Saanich police um, got to stay on the case, which is not what I wanted. However, major crime unit, uh, was uh, now is now involved and a team leader from the major crime unit oversees the case and they are from the uh, rcmp not sandwich police sandwich police didn't do this the provincial government stepped in and so now there's a better organization with the investigation yes we still don't have results but we've got a team leader who knows what he's doing uh, people have been re-interviewed. There is now forensic work being done on uh, through a crime lab in the United States, which has leading DNA technology. And we're awaiting results of that. And everybody's been re-interviewed. I get a monthly call from that team leader, and we have discussions. I still don't get any information at all about details of the case which we all feel should be released now because of the time period. Um, so there is some organization now. My disappointment with Saanich Police is, of course, they didn't do their duty. They haven't solved the case. And, you know, we've gone through about four mayors. We've had, I think, six um, police chiefs. And the last three have been involved in Lindsay's murder, both as detectives and as police chiefs. So. You know, they've all failed in their duty. The last head of the file, part of that whole shuffle with the provincial government, he got retired and uh, he failed too, that he, you know, he couldn't solve the case. So they go around, typically their deal is at Saanich Police, they try and make me look like I'm crazy. Um, they try and discredit me in the public. Um, I, I tried to make peace with this one officer who's retired Last year at the walk, we shook hands. I apologize for being tough with him. He's still poking me out there on different podcasts and things. And I just say, you know, give it up, man. Like, come on. We made peace. You'd want this war some more? I can do it. I'll, I'll gladly, I'll get back out there and tell people who you are and how you function. Uh, like, stop it. Stop it. Yeah. Do the job. You're not a police officer anymore? Go home and shut up. You know, don't be out there trying to criticize what I do. My kid was murdered. You know, I'm not happy about that. I'm disappointed in the authorities because everybody seems to know who did it except them. Uh, the job needs to be done, and I'm not going to stop pushing till it's done. And whoever can't do the job, yes, I'm going to get critical of them. Yes. I'm not going to praise somebody that fails. Like, what kind of insanity is that? Yeah. You mentioned DNA and that there's a new lab that's involved. Do we know if there is DNA from the perpetrators in this case? We know there's DNA at the case. I mean, again, Saanich police saying, oh, there's so much misinformation out there. Well, they're the, they're the source of it because they tell people publicly, oh, there's no DNA. There's DNA. There's DNA. Okay. Okay. And before, you know, when I had spoken to you previously, I think genetic genealogy was just breaking or hadn't even broke yet. So in terms of an investigative tool, like if they find a profile for that perpetrator, even if they can't find a one-to-one -one match somehow, there should be a way to backtrace that and figure out who that person is. I think there is, and I believe that's what they're working on. They won't tell me that, of course, and I can respect that because in Canada, because of our laws, they have to be very careful what they share with me that it doesn't jeopardize the case when it goes to trial. Yeah, I get that point. 
and I'm okay with it uh, because I want success here. But, um, you know, yes, the DNA technology is there. It's getting better all the time. Whether they have good stuff or not, I don't know. What I am told is that they have a certain amount of samples, and each time you have to give some up right. when it's being tested. So they have to be able to say, okay, if we give it all up now because of the tech current technology, then we don't have any for the future as the technology improves. So they got to dish it out a little bit at a time yeah. and say, okay. So right now they told me they're doing three tests. Each of them take about three months. And I haven't verified this, so I don't know if there's any experts out there you can tell us differently. But that's what they've told me. They're doing three different tests. Each one takes about three months. The crime lab has a long queue because it's the popular place to go right now. And uh, so they're waiting results of that. And they don't have a timeline because of this long queue. So that's what we're waiting for. In the meantime, they've re-interviewed everybody or people of interest or that kind of stuff. Okay. Uh, so I had mentioned at the start of all this about the Capital Daily article and that the title of the article seemed to suggest that they were going to straighten out, out all the false information on the internet, but there was really only one paragraph and they really didn't give a correcting source necessarily. Uh, they said, quote, reports of more than 40 or 50 stab wounds are false and exaggerated. So too are reports that certain parts of Lindsay's body were targeted during the attack. According to information obtained by Capital Daily, there were multiple stab wounds, nicks, and cuts on Lindsay's body, including her chest and abdomen. As of press time, there are at least nine stories published by traditional media outlets containing misinformation about the number of stab wounds. So they seem really focused on that. Have you heard that that number, the 40 to 50 range, is incorrect? I haven't heard it's incorrect. Um, I don't know what the actual number is. Uh, because it's an active case, the autopsy is not public and it won't be released. I can't get it. Nobody can get it. So whatever information they have is maybe better information than what I have. I talk to people on the scene and people involved with their body, uh, which I won't name, and I was told those numbers. And so that's what I go on. If it's different, yes, yeah, so be it. It's different. Who Really, does it matter? Yeah. Yeah. You know, does it matter whether it was 20 or whether it was 50? She's dead. She was murdered by stabbing. We know that. So, you know, again, just another distraction about numbers, you know. Oh, yeah, there was it was only 22 and you're saying, you know, 29. So you're a liar. Right. Come on. I don't know the exact number. That's, I was told in excess of 40. Yeah, that's um, an unfortunate side effect just of true crime in general. And I think part of even the story that you've told me previously about having like administrators that are working on the site. And then all of a sudden it, there's a weird power feed that people sometimes get about becoming the expert on a particular case. And mm -hmm. I kind of got a dose of that through this capital daily thing. Like effectively, what did that paragraph tell us? Nothing except you guys are all wrong. We have better information and you guys are all wrong. So that, that really isn't helpful. Um, yeah. but, what I'm also bothered by is this is the second time I've talked to you, Jeff, and said, why is there a news publication that is proclaiming to have more information? Last time I was talking to you about Dateline, how is Dateline supposedly getting access to some form of police reports and sharing that that detailed level of information when you don't have it? Like it's I understand integrity of the investigation, but why are you opening up to news sources and feeding them better details? than even the father of the victim. Those news sources are going to turn it into public information. So I don't I don't understand. Exactly. That. Yeah, I don't understand either. That's been my plight with Sandwich Police. They they just don't want to cooperate. They basically from day one it was like, go home, be quiet, let us do our job. That was their deal. And uh, then you know they've lied to me a few times. I've caught them lying. Uh, they were going to make it a cold case and then I said great we'll turn over the information for me. And then, of course, as a result of that, I demanded it. They said, oh, we had a meeting and it's active. So they've kept it active ever since. Um, as far as the news stories, sharing with them, you know, I don't care. I, I, again, I want resolution. So if they want to share with them, that's fine. I do know with Dateline, 
everybody was pretty serious because that was early on. They did share a certain amount of the information with Dateline. So I hold Dateline as one of the benchmarks of this murder investigation. And I hold your podcast as one of our benchmarks as well. And uh, Dateline was given access. So after that, I went to Saanich Police and I said, okay, you opened up certain parts of the file to Dateline. They've got information. Um, they can't give it to me because they have to sign whatever with Saanich Police. So I said, how about giving me that information? And I was told by Saanich Police that, no, we're not going to give you the information we gave them. But if you ask us the right questions, that access that information we gave Dateline will answer your question. So what oh. do you want to know? So it was like a cat and mouse game. And I said, well, why can't you just give it to me? You gave it to them. Right. Well, we're not going to do that. Well, honestly, that even kind of explains this paragraph that I read from Capital Daily, because maybe that's the same mechanism they had, because all they're saying is <laughs> that everyone else is wrong. So effectively, maybe they just asked SPD, was it really in excess of 40 stab wounds? No. Oh, okay. And now they're running around saying that, you know, all these other publications are incorrect. Um, right. But Sanix police also told me at one point when I caught them lying on a couple of occasions and, and I'm okay with it now. I don't hold it against them. The officer at that time who was head of the file <laughs> virtually said, I might have a couple of words wrong, but he was like, Jeff, come on. Do you think we catch criminals by telling the truth all the time? Yeah. Give your head a shake. Yeah. That was a real eye opener for me. That didn't lessen my respect for the police. I thought at first, you know, I was very disappointed because I was like, you guys are lying. And then when the way he put that to me and we were in a bit of a heated discussion, I was like, holy, well, that's good. They're using every technique in the book yeah. to try and fool people. So then, you know, I've tried it a couple of times too, publicly. And I do do it in a certain way with those that want to get close to me. I'll release information to mm. certain people only. Right. And then and see then, where it winds up. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. When it comes back to me, and I've had that with Sanders police, right? Mm -hmm. When I've told them something and then all of a sudden it comes back to me and I go, well, you know, they told somebody. Yeah. Yeah. And I've had that, like the volunteer, the whistleblower there, same thing. They came out with something and I was like, I only told her. Right. Right. And it was false. Uh, something I did learn about at the Capital Daily article that I don't remember previously was about bloody sock prints that were found and that basically the sock prints confirmed that it was indeed a man and a woman. I know I had asked you before because we were kind of theorizing was it possible that it was two men and one was dressed up as a woman? Um, do you know if that was a woman, if there was indeed a woman with the man? That's a really broad question, but here's what I do know about it is one of the theories I work with is that uh, there was a transgender involved. That's just one of the theories. I'm not saying that's what went down. Right. So that's possible that there were two men one was trans that's one of the working theories that i have right um but what i do know from information i've gathered over the 15 plus years is that there were bloody footprints on the stairs and that was from first-hand evidence first him that saw bloody footprints on the stairs and that i do know at the real estate firm remax Camosen, that saanich police uh came there looking for women with a size eight shoe size mm. okay okay so that might be connected if they found a print that was a size eight for a woman okay Right. Um, it's interesting you bring that up. I, I don't think I realized that there would be trails like that in the house. And I know a lot of us were wondering, 
uh, and it comes up in retellings of the story everywhere. How did Jason know to run into that particular room? Um, interestingly, it looks like he was spoken to for this recent article that came out and he gave a little twist on the explanation. He's basically saying that he started heading up the stairs and as he was heading up the stairs, it gave him a sight line to Lindsay being slumped up against a wall. So he knew immediately as soon as, as he was coming up the stairs. But it's strange to me to think that, well, you've got all these tracks all over the house. And if you see bloody footprints on the tracks, like, you know, on the stairs, like you, you'll follow those back to their source and they'll be getting stronger as you get back to the origination point. But that's not coming up for some reason in, in his explanation. Have you seen the layout out of the house? Do you know, does it make sense for him to have seen her as he was coming up the stairs? No. Okay. I know the house well. Uh, it was, you know, I couldn't recall it to you in detail today, but right after it was released from police, I was in the house for probably two, two and a half hours. I spent in there crying, sobbing, screaming, whatever going on. I took some pictures. So some of the pictures that are out there are pictures that I took. Yeah. Uh, because police haven't released any crime photos. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I looked around that house very carefully. I was in by myself. As a matter of fact, one of my ex-girlfriends called me and said, like, where are you? What are you doing? I said, I'm at the house. She goes, oh, my God, you can't be there by yourself. I'm coming over right now. So, you know, I spent a lot of time there. And when you come in the front door, there was a living room to your left. Right was the dining room. It's a hallway. Stairs are off to the right-hand side. There's a closet there. And then straight ahead is a kitchen, family room. And then there's other rooms to the right. So when you come in the front door, the stairs aren't front and center first and foremost. Okay. They're off to the right side. I was told, first-hand witness that was there at the scenes, you can figure out who that was, mm -hmm. that as they were opening the door, Jason pushed it open. So he didn't wait for it to come open. He pushed it open, more or less pushed the person out of the way ran straight up the stairs to the master bedroom where Lindsay was laying in a pool of blood, which there's a picture out there of a plywood floor with a big white patch. I took that picture. Yeah. So I can only assume that the big white patch on the plywood floor was where she was laying in the pool of blood. So after they took up flooring, carpet, whatever was there, um, there was blood on the floor. So rather than tearing that plywood base floor up, they just painted it over in white. The wall hadn't been painted and there were no other tracks towards the wall. So I don't even know that she was slumped against the wall. Okay. All I know is that she was laying on the floor in a pool of blood. And that seems to be what Cohen and Jason described too. There's other people that do podcasts and they make it up. Yeah. You know, they make up, oh, oh, she was laying against the wall. She was this, she was that. Uh, yeah, I don't know that kind of stuff. And I try to tell the my truth all the time, as accurate as I possibly can, so that it doesn't get distracted out there. But when you run up the stairs, there's a hallway, because it was a multi-bedroom home. Right. So yeah. you come up the stairs, there's a bit of a turn in the stairs, you come straight up, and the master bedroom was to the right. And then there was bathroom and other bedrooms along that hallway. So to know and and where her body was laying was probably not quite in line with the door. It might have been towards the front a little bit. So you would have to, in my opinion, I don't know why, he pushed the door open and went straight up the stairs. Yeah. Either he knew where to go. Well, unless, unless you, unless you heard this story, which we're not hearing the story of, we came in, I saw bloody footprints. They were leading up the stairs. I went up the stairs, but no, we're not hearing not, that. Yeah. We're not hearing that. No, no. We're just hearing, he pushed the door open, ran straight up the stairs, right to where she was laying. So, you know, I've been in real estate since 1980. And, uh, to do that, you, you gotta know something's going on. Yeah. Plus you get to the top of the stairs, like you would hesitate and go, okay, what's going on? Which side? Not just direct to where she was right. direct to where she was. That's really odd to me. Really odd. 
but you know prior to that it was all odd he arrives drives by you know sees people and his word is oh well i thought the meeting was ending right well why would they be exiting the door if the meeting's ending or sorry or going he back said, in. i thought the meeting was just beginning right like what how does a meeting begin by people exiting a door like it just doesn't make sense then he goes and parks and sits there for 10 minutes facing away from the house, but he could see it in his rear view mirrors and then moves the vehicle, goes out onto the street, sits there, parks for another 10 minutes and waits. Yeah. It's just all odd to behavior to me, really odd behavior. To me. Yeah. I was just curious about that because it was kind of a new twist on uh, that I had seen in terms of trying to address that question, which I know was a huge question in terms of the internet, just asking about this case, like why would he have gone up there? And it looks like, I think he did speak to Capitol Daily. I think that, that description is coming directly from him that he had a sight line to Lindsay being slumped against a wall, but, um, yeah, no way, no yeah. way. I walked that house. I was in there. I spent time there. No way you had a sight line. Okay. No way. Now, uh, you did tell me last time we spoke about, a version of the dress, the striped dress that the female was wearing being found in a thrift store. What mm -hmm. came of all that? Well, what came of it was uh, Saanich police didn't show up to collect the dress. So um, the woman ended up buying it, taking it home. They said, oh, we'll pick it up. They never came and got it. So, you know, I was in communication with her. So five days later, she took it in because the officer in charge at the time said, oh, we'll reimburse you for the cost, bring it in, or we'll come and get it, which they didn't do. So she took it in, and um, the people on staff there at the time said, no, we're not reimbursing you. It's like, you know, give us the dress. So I ended up sending her some money myself, which, by the way, I was never reimbursed for, mm -hmm. which I don't care. Yeah, I don't care. But just the fact, right? So they have that dress, and uh, when we had a fairly heated argument about the whole dress thing, they told me they have five of them, so that it wasn't, it didn't seem to be a big deal to them. So I don't know that the dress is as huge an issue as people make it out to be. That you know we should trace this, trace that. I'm hoping they have a handle on it, and that uh, that isn't a big part of the the thing but as far as the dress goes yes i think it had a purpose there's other theories around that that another woman we talked to her friend was dealing with shirley zalo and she had a dress exactly like that and it was missing from her closet after a showing so i don't know where we're going with the dress i think um okay. dna is going to solve this murder and i think um somebody needs to talk i think there's people out there that know what happened yeah they have information that's critical to this murder and uh we need to hear from them um if they have a conscience if they have kids if they realize the pain and suffering that's going on and if they realize that you know how much of a detriment to society this is to not solve these murders um, they need to come forward. They really do. They, they will be the heroes. Right. That's who the hero will be, not police. Police yeah. need to do their job and forget about their hero status. The heroes are the ones that have information that come forward and are, and are honest. That's the hero. Yeah. Um, one more thing I want to point out from the Capital Daily article. Um, they said that there was a laptop that was used by Lindsay and Jason and that it was analyzed by police. And the police found that there was some type of chat history that had been deleted from it. Then there's another officer they quote that says that Lindsay's Facebook wall was looked weird because there was no posts on it from January 25th to February 3rd. And that that was strange compared to the previous time frame. And she had like 700 friends. So she had posts that should have been on her wall regularly. And that those messages could have only been deleted essentially by someone that had Lindsay's login. So knowing that there was a shared laptop laptop between Lindsay and Jason that looks like there were some messages removed from it, and her Facebook page had a bunch of posts removed from it, it's interesting to me that this article kind of aims towards this, you know, Jason didn't have anything to do with this. Oh, but by the way, here's some physical evidence that kind of supports that maybe he did. Like you would have needed a machine that she was logged in on 
to delete those Facebook posts. Now, I guess uh, they did get a quote from another member of the police department that said, I think they actually subpoenaed or uh, they, they took a warrant to Facebook to get the deleted messages or to attempt to get the deleted messages. And then they were told that, you know, ah, there was really nothing in there. What I'd be more curious about is when the messages were deleted, like is because if it could have only been done with her login and it was done after the attack, that would be very, very telling, even if there wasn't anything really important or critical in those messages. Do you know about any of this aspect or have any additional detail on it? All I do know is that, um, yes, the police confirmed that there were there was information off her electronic devices that was deleted prior to her murder. Prior and to, not after? Prior to. Okay, okay. Because at murder, they they took possession of the condominium where Lindsay and Jason lived and all its uh, assets, Jason's vehicle and Lindsay's phone. So sometime prior, that stuff was deleted. Okay. Is my understanding. Whether that's the truth or not, I don't know. That's my truth. And... I know Lindsay wouldn't do that. If if she did, by chance, there'd be a history of her doing that previously. Right. Not just all of a sudden, this one time, she's going to delete everything two weeks prior to her murder. So, yeah, it's very curious, you know, who did that. And the other thing that, you know, is if it is deleted... I'm of the understanding nowadays that police have the technology to get that out of your computer. So, you know, hopefully they've done that. One thing I do have to comment about Capital Daily, mm -hmm. even though I said earlier, you know, they turned it all into some kind of uh, crazy journalism, tabloid type journalism. I'll give them credit that, you know, Part of that article and other stuff they've done has been very supportive to seeing Lindsay's murder solved. I'll give them credit for that. I give them credit for going to court. They probably spent hundreds of thousands of dollars going to court. They took Saanich police or the provincial government, whoever, to court to gain access to the file. They did that at their own expense, and I really appreciated that. I have no problem with that whatsoever. I think that was great they did that because it's a huge undertaking it takes years to go through the court system the sad part of it is it distracts the police of course because now they got to defend themselves in court so they're not focusing on the file they're busy trying to defend themselves in court and what happened was the information that capital daily got was mostly redacted information so for those who don't understand that term they got access to a whole bunch of it but everything was blacked out. So it was like felt pen through all the stuff. That's redacted. So yep. they felt pen everything out. So they got little tidbits of information uh, out of what they applied for in court. And then finally, their last effort at court, the judge sealed the file. Mm -hmm. Okay. Like, no access, no more court, no more information. I was told they're going to continue. They were going to continue pursuing it. But not too long after that happened, uh, Capital Daily fired some of their people, right? Xander, the author of the article, was threatening me to be part of the article. And if not, he was going to, you know, make me look bad, all that kind of stuff. Mm. And, you know, I could probably do some kind of legal stuff about that. But I'm just not interested in that distraction, that cost, all that stuff. I, I just think he may be one of the ones that got fired. <laughs> Um, but if he wasn't, I just felt that, you know, a good part of the article was great. It was, I think so too. Was, I'm conflicted yeah, was, because there was, was, yeah, there's new information in there that, that I'm like, oh, that's interesting. You could tell they dug in here. I was obviously annoyed by the, you know, well, everyone's wrong about this information, but we're not going to, not going to tell you what the correct information is. But mm -hmm. yeah, there was several points. That's why I wanted to run them by you. I'm like, I haven't heard of this before. And this sounds legit. The half that article feels very well done. And then 
it's interesting you talk about this potential threat of, you know, kind of throwing your name around because the bottom half of the article, like that is the intent of it. It's, it's so obvious and clear and it actually doesn't even fit the tone of the rest of the article. Like, no, it's almost like it's written by two separate people. And I think there are, there is actually two people on it. Um, one that was kind of trying to do legit journalism and the other that was trying to make it a little more, I don't know, clickable, you know, snappy title, and then also slam you in the middle of it. Yeah, they reason. they really took a cheap shot at me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that was the sad part. They destroyed the whole article by doing that. Because yeah. I, I agree with you. I think a good part of it was good journalism. Mm -hmm. And then it was just that, that cheap tabloid crap they brought up in the end. And they pulled out Shirley and this whistleblower. Her name's Sandra, by the way. I know her well. Yeah. Uh, they're just bitter women. Just bitter women. My ex-wife, bitter women. You know, I've asked all of them, you know, this is an important point I haven't brought up, but uh, earlier this year, I there's certain information I don't have that Shirley Zalo has, my ex-wife has, and they won't tell me. They won't release it. Uh, the police probably know it as well. They won't tell me. I was told there was a life insurance policy on Lindsay. All I asked was who, who benefited from that. They won't tell me. Hmm. I was asked who got the uh, in life insurance money that the real estate board has on every realtor there. They won't tell me. Mm. Neither Shirley Zalo, my ex-wife Evelyn, Saanich Police, none of them will tell me. Isn't there investigators for that type of stuff? Because I know... Well, there is. But, yeah. You know, again, it, it kind of doesn't matter to me as sure. far as let's get people arrested. But I think it's important. And I think I should know. We should know. Like, yeah. what happened there? Lindsay told me when she came to visit me that, uh, you know, obviously there was a whole discussion about her breaking up with Jason. How do I do this? What am I going on? How to get myself into this mess, she called it, with the Zalo family. And uh, so we had discussions about that. And she just said, you know, look, Daddy, I've got some deals closing on March the 2nd. Or March the 1st. And she said, if I leave before that, Shirley's going to make a mess of it. I'll never get paid for that. I just can't. I just have to wait for those deals. And that could have been, you know, I'd have to guess, but let's say in the neighborhood of thirty to $50,000. Mm -hmm. So substantial. Yeah. So to hack it out for another month or so, okay, fine, whatever. You know, get your deals closed because I'm in real estate. So I understand how that all works and how it can be made difficult. So I asked also Shirley Zalo, my ex-wife Evelyn, who got that money? Where did that money go? They won't answer these questions, John, as if I'm some kind of bad guy. Yeah, yeah. Like, where's the money? Who got the money? I don't want part of it. And I want to be very clear about that to everybody. No, I know you're looking for, I mean, th that money, of course, is a, is a big factor in some of these crimes. Sometimes you yes. trace the money. So you just want to see right. what, who benefited. Yeah. Who right. Benefited. Right. Like this money that I know about, who got it? Just right. tell me. Like, what's the big issue here? And of course, my ex-wife, Evelyn, she got pretty tricky about the whole thing. Um, she's been very bitter ever since we parted. And that was well over 25 years ago. Still bitter, bitter woman. It just blows my mind. Anyhow, when Lindsay was murdered, uh, you know, there were certain things to do. And she said, okay, look, we've got a bunch of this stuff to take care of. Because I, I didn't live in Victoria at the time. I was living in Calgary, which is 1,000 kilometers away, 600 miles. Um, so, you know, I was thinking we're going to get together because our daughter was murdered and, and, you know, work on this together. It hasn't been the case from day one. So she comes to me and says, you know, look, we got a whole bunch of stuff here that we have to look after. And I said, sure, okay. And she goes, well, why don't you let me handle the financial stuff? Because I know Lindsay's bank accounts and all her personal things. And uh, and you can handle some of this other stuff, the funeral, some of the funeral arrangements, the burial, you know, those sorts of things. And I go, fair enough. Yeah, we divide up the work. And so, uh, and I said, you know, but I'd like to know what's going on. Oh, yeah, I'll share everything with you. I'll make sure everything is, you know, out in the open. Okay, fine. So then she comes to me the next day and she goes, you know, I need you to sign this because we're joint custody or whatever it was called. 
uh, joint guardianship, whatever it is when you get divorced. And um, she said, uh, I need you to sign this just to give me authority so that I don't have to track you down every time we need a signature or something. And I go, oh, fair enough. Just let me know what's going on. Oh, yeah, for sure. As soon as I inked it, that was it. Mm. I'm out. I was out. I was back to, you bastard, you know. I hate you. Oh, okay. Yeah. And and believe it or not, the people need to know this too. Shirley Zalo and my ex, Evelyn, are friends. Really? Really. Hmm. Um, yeah, I understand that there's, I... there's a lot of kind of interconnectedness there too. As a matter of fact, the article mentions that uh, your daughter, Sarah, actually worked with Jason also? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you can imagine the... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That is tangled. That is a tangled web. Very tangled web. Um, last time we spoke, you mentioned that you thought, or that Lindsay had told you that she had witnessed something, but she wouldn't tell you what it was, something that she was very agi or upset about and nervous about. Have you learned since what that possibly was or do you have any other thoughts on what that could have been that she witnessed that she was so nervous about i don't know specifically what it was okay. but what i do know from my intuition and my relationship with lindsay is i know she told somebody and i say that as a father knowing my daughter not I physically know it. I know she told somebody because Lindsay was that type of person. She would never, ever be able to keep something solely to herself. She's told somebody. She wanted to tell me. And I have a pretty good suspicion who she told. And neither one of those people will communicate with me anymore. Mm. I am hoping and I'm almost certain that they did tell police. And police probably told them, don't tell him. And that's fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So that's one part of it. The other part of it is knowing Lindsay very well. Um, the reason she wouldn't tell me is because she was in it. Yeah. yeah. And as soon as she was out of it, she would tell me. That was kind of our discussion. And she just said, Daddy, I'm handling it. I'll tell you. So I knew that's because she was in it. Well, what she was in was in relationship with Jason and working for his mom. Um, you know, and that was a big problem that she was trying to figure out how to get out of that. So that's what it involved. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind. And it involved people that shouldn't be involved in criminal activity. Right. I can assure you of that. Uh, another aspect of this case was... Uh, when it broke, there was kind of a lot of focus given to realtor safety and like people thinking about how can we avoid these types of things happening? Unfortunately, I think there's a couple of other cases with some similar elements to it. Do you know, have you seen any changes in the industry resulting from this about safety in these situations? You know, initially there was, I don't think it's changed too much now from what it used to be. Um, there's a group certainly a, a percentage now that pay closer attention to that yeah and uh but i think it's still business as usual people doing open houses people getting calls to show places they go out and do that there's no doubt in my mind i still work the industry i'm not retired i can't retire because of you know all my resources have gone to trying to figure out who killed my daughter and now any resources i have left and thankfully help from the public is lawsuit stuff right. Right. um you know they're gonna burn me down now so yeah i don't think the industry has changed dramatically there's been some minor changes but i think for the most part it's forgotten till something like this reminds them certainly you know i talk to realtors lots i don't work residential anymore i do mostly pretty much just industrial mm -hmm. and of course it's not there's no safety in industrial it's like right. Right. throwing warehouses in the middle of timbuktu that are vacant um, and residential, when I talk to somebody, everybody knows about Lindsay's murder everywhere I go, which is great. Um, so they, they talk about it, you right. know, that, oh yeah, you know, if I get worried, I call my dad or whoever. 
So yeah, there's that part, but not near the changes there should be. Like I, I do think that if the industry as a whole mandated uh, how it was supposed to transpire, that would make a change. But there's a refusal to do that. Even if it was mandated, you know, people would not follow the rules, but it would be a bigger majority that did if it was mandated by the industry. Sure. And probably the mandate could be, which a lot of realtors follow, is if you're interested in a property, you want to make contact with a realtor, you want to see something, you have to come to the office in person and meet right. before anything else happens. Yeah. Yeah. Copy their ID, have them fill out a, an application of some kind. Yeah. Yeah. Show up, prove who you are, what your intentions are, notes done on that, and then away you go from there. Right. Right. Yeah. I didn't think about that. That This does sound like a little bit of a strange situation. She was representing them. She was on the buying side for them, right? That's correct. Buyer's agent. Okay. And there was no seller's agent that was going to be there? Uh, in this particular house, it was new, vacant. There was a lockbox, meaning there were keys in a box. Um, and it was show at any time. Supposedly, okay. the owner, who was personal friends with Shirley Zalo and her boyfriend, didn't know there was a showing, but he was there just after 5 o'clock turning on some lights in the house. But yeah. Supposedly, he didn't know it was being shown. Right. Uh, Jeff, how can people that are out there watching help support you and your efforts and keep up to date on this? What's, what's the best resource for doing all that? You know, I think the best thing people can do is, uh, to write to the mayor of Saanich, write to the police chief, write to the, um, attorney general of British Columbia, write to the premier of British Columbia, demand that action be taken to solve Lindsay Buziak's murder because the public's in danger. There are killers on the loose and have been for the last 15 years. The more that do that, the better. The more that do that, the more results there are, the more resources are focused on the case. And people in my situation from around the world have to understand that. The more people that will support you in doing that, and when I say write, emails are great. Yeah, they'll get an automatic response. They'll think it had no effect. Yes, it does. If there's 5,000 arrive or 15,000 or 50,000 emails, it has an effect. They have to pay attention to that. If it's five, yeah, they toss them in the garbage. They delete them. Sure. They can't ignore 5,000, 50,000, 15,000. And people just need to do that. Like, two minutes like i almost want to beg them to please do that yeah yeah uh jeff is there a, a list of addresses that you have do you have a couple of email addresses that i put i could put in the description box that people can use i can't rattle them off to you right at this moment but sure. i can send them to you yeah send them to me and i'll make sure that they're included uh in the in the video so people can go ahead and click in the description box use those addresses and, and send some of those letters off yeah, I'd really appreciate that. You got it. And did I hear, do you have a Facebook page? I do. It's my name, Jeff Buziak, at, or sorry, Jeff Buziak. I'm on Facebook. I think there's just two of us. Um, my Facebook page has a doctor. It was a picture of me sitting with Dr. Phil. Okay. And also a um, picture of Lindsay. Okay. Okay. I'll get a link to that in the description box down below as right. well. And, and then, of course, the website's still active. LindsayBuziakMurder.com. All right. We'll have a link down there too as well. Jeff, uh, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you being here again. And for all the contact throughout the years, Jeff and I have messages every now and then just kind of checking in with each other. Uh, I really, really appreciate you and your openness and honesty about all this. And I really can't wait for the day where I'm looking at you on this little monitor and we're talking about the arrest that's happened. John, I can hardly wait for that day as well. And I thank you so much for your support. And uh, when that day comes, honestly, I'll let you know as fast as I possibly can. And uh, it'll be thanks to your support and all your wonderful listeners. You've done such a fabulous job, John. Thank you, sir. You got it. Anytime.
I am very proud to have this platform and to be able to give someone like Jeff all the time and space he needs to share all that information. I wouldn't have it without you guys. So thank you so much. I really appreciate each and every one of you. Please have a great weekend and join us again here next week on the Lord and Arch channel.